Hey guys, it's Charlie here. And before we get into today's episode of TOEFOP, we have some exciting news. TOEFOP is heading back to the live stage. That's right, TOEFOP will be taking part in the Great Australian Podcast Festival, happening November 6th and 7th at the Palais Theatre in Melbourne. So if you've ever wanted to know what a comedy conversation between two old mates looks like live on stage, then get your tickets by going to thegreataustralianpodcastfestival.com.au or follow the link in the episode description below. The Great Australian Podcast Festival. Tickets go on sale Thursday. Get in early so you don't miss out. The following episode of TOEFOP is rated MA for mature audiences. It may contain sexual references, time travel references, allegations of bin misconduct, and mild coarse language. TOEFOP advises that this episode is not suitable for anyone under the age of 15 or anyone who thinks a comedy conversation between two old mates sounds like a terrible idea for a show. Minors must be accompanied by a parent or guardian. This is John Deke speaking. Everyone relax, this is Tofop, I'm Charlie Clawson. I'm Will Anderson, hello and thank you for watching. That was the most professional intro we've done yet. I think we, Mike did the three, two, one, but didn't say go, didn't say proceed, didn't say begin, didn't say commence. He just left the one hanging and let me take my own time to do the intro. So thanks, Mike. I think, I think what it is, is Mike's rocked up today in our traditional segment, what is podcast <laughs> Mike wearing? Uh, like a young Nick Offerman. <laughs> if they were making like a young rock style TV show about uh, Nick Offerman, I think that's what Podcast Mike has come dressed as today. And I think that element of Nick Offerman-esque practicality has also infected the way that he has introduced the show today. You know, I didn't even take note of what Mike was wearing because I'm so taken with what you're wearing. You look like... You look like an, a rocker from the 90s who the band's reformed. You look like you're Tom Morello and you're, you're out in Australia. <laughs> you kind of look, you've got your denim jacket buttoned up, you've got your black hoodie underneath, you've got your nice specs on and a, and a baseball cap. You look, yeah, you look like Tom Morello. Is that, was that an intentional look? Yeah, that's right. I got up this morning and I said, you know what I'm going to do today? <laughs> If there's a machine, I'm going to rage against it. So I better Morello it up. I thought that it would be culturally inappropriate to Zach Della Rocca it mm. up. I feel like that's, you know, if I went into Della Rocca face, that would be in, <laughs> offensive even in an audio medium. But uh, yeah, I guess I am a little Tom Morello. So you woke up and the first thing you said was, fuck you, toaster. I'm not going to do what you tell me. I won't do what you tell me. <laughs> and the toaster's like, I don't tell you to do anything. You just put toast in me. If anything, if anyone's been exploited here, it's you, human. In fact, I rage against the humans. You know what? I've got to be honest with you. I did rage against the toaster. And in general, I rage against the toaster. Because for whatever reason, I've got my toaster set to a setting. Mm. Th there's a little knob on it. You know, obviously, the uh, you know how much you're going to toast your toaster knob. Yeah, the darkness um, knob. And, and I never trust like what I've set it to. For whatever reason, I always will go a little bit early. I'll be like, I don't I reckon this is gonna burn my toast. Yeah. And then I second guess the toaster. And then when it hasn't like or when it has burnt my toast, I get angry at it. So I guess I do rage against the machine. Maybe that is actually the spirit of Tom Morello that is infusing me when I get up in the morning and I put that toast in the toaster and then I get angry at the fact that it doesn't toast my toast properly. I'm like, yeah, fuck you, toaster. What's Will fuck doing? Fuck you. He's, I will not do what you're telling me. He's just been standing. And he walks into the kitchen and I'm just yelling at the toaster. I was at Will's the other morning for breakfast. He stood in front of the coffee machine for half an hour and just gave it the finger. Actually, again, another example. I did go to the coffee machine this morning and it said that I had to clean the like the nozzle that like yeah. hits the milk it like sent me a message and i went fuck you <laughs> coffee machine i'm not gonna clean the nozzle i'm just going to <laughs> proceed through it take that the old double tom i mean i'm fascinated by uh the the, the toast gradient because um i uh, make toast every night for iona and Gemma and i come from two different schools of thought when it comes to toast i'm very much a well done toast kind of guy i don't even mind if it's a bit like charcoal around the edges, I like it to be crunchy and I like it dry. Where Jem is like a lightly toast, like virtually just w she wants warm, warm bread. bread. Yeah. Where do you fall <laughs> on the toast? Could you argument? please heat up the bread? I, it does depend on, I've got to say, I have a real, when it comes to toast, there's a real gradient and it really does depend on what else I'm going to add to the toast. So like I'm a heavy toast cooker 
if I'm going to be putting like you know butter and avocado, maybe like cheese. So you need you, like you need the structural integrity to hold it together. You don't want it to be f- flopping and flipping as you put it to your mouth, right? It's the foundation. <laughs> I'm just like, well, there is no way that warm bread is going to support the structure that I'm going to build on top of this. Whereas if it is just the bread that I'm going for, I think I am a little bit more warm bread. Get, keep the structural integrity of the bread. Don't turn it into toast. I hate the warm bread thing. I'm like, what's the point? What is the point of warm bread? Like you got bread and you got toast. Those two worlds should never meet. In fact, one of my favorite things to do is to burn the shit out of toast, like cook it real, real hard, chart around the edges. Then I will let the toast cool until it's just like cardboard. And then I will put butter and Vegemite on it and tr- and just crunch away at it like the crunchiest treat there is. Okay, so basically you're just saying, I like to ruin bread. <laughs> <laughs> like, because this is, because bread has already been hot. Yeah. At some stage in the process, the bread was hot in order to cook the bread. It is then cooled into the bread type that you have. Because like warm bread, like bread mm. just out of the oven, that's your your ultimate sort of bread. You're yeah. at a restaurant, they've just cooked some bread, they've brought out some, you know, some warm butter. bread, you've got some butter oh. there, like beautiful. Don't like even need, a, need, don't need, need a main course when, that, when you go to a restaurant <laughs> that, that, that's that, that good. And then it cools down into its natural state. And then there's like a reheating process. But you go a step further. You're like, Kill it. I'm going to reheat it to the maximum again. And then I'm going to let it cool yet again. Well, you know what I am? I'm a crouton man. I dig a crouton. <laughs> I like dry, crunchy bread. In fact, I get so excited when I get a salad and I didn't realize there's croutons involved. I'm like, this is just like upgraded this salad from okay to excellent. Yeah. You're just like, I want that Caesar salad. You know, the one that comes with toast on it. Yeah. <laughs> I also hate too when you get croutons that you're meant to put in your soup and then you let them get soggy. I'm like, what's the point, man? Like, get them crunchy. Don't let that don't let that bread go back to its natural form. Right, again, you're just like, you hate bread in its natural form. You're like, whatever I can do to sort of terraform this bread, then I'm in. Now, I'm trying to think about when do I – I do like fresh bread. Oh, you know what I am? I'm like, yeah, what about a sandwich? Like, like a, yeah. are you a sandwich eater? Not, not really. I like fresh bread if it's like the day of from a bakery. Like I – I've just, maybe I've spoiled myself, but I, I've got a really great bakery. In fact, the last few years I've had great bakeries all around me. And so I've been very spoiled, been able to get fresh bread quite easily. And the bakery near me at the moment makes the best sourdough I've ever eaten in my life. And so to go to like a supermarket or get like prepackaged bread now, even if it's like, you know, your fancy Helga's or, or whatever, just tastes like garbage as far as I'm concerned. You can taste like the sugar and the salt, whereas this this is like premium bread. So that bread... I'll eat straight up. Yeah. But you ask the question, is is the bread Helga's? And you go, well, if it is, I spit in your face <laughs> with your Fuck disgusting bread. Helga's bread. Fuck Helga. Fuck Helga's children. Fuck the descendants of Helga. I'm going straight to the local bakery for some sourdough. The only thing that's worthy of going between two slices of Helga is a pile of shit. Now get out of here. <laughs> You know what I use Helga's for? Toilet paper. I don't bulk buy, bulk buy toilet paper in vaccine lockdowns. I go straight to the bread aisle. I get myself 18, and I like the fiber stuff, you know, for obviously for the toilet, cleans things up well. <laughs> but here's the thing, right? So I'll buy that uh, delicious fresh bakery bread, and it'll stay out for a couple of hours. But then as soon as everyone's had uh, their fill of bread, straight in the freezer. I do not allow it to go stale in any form. It just goes bagged up and straight in the freezer and then I try and make it last for like a week. Interesting. So like, yeah, so you go the fresh bread option. As soon as anyone's had some fresh bread, mm-hmm. you're just like, well, that's it. That's it, cut this off. bread is going straight in the deep freeze yeah. until call, it's needed again. Call this loaf Walt Disney because we're putting him in ice. <laughs> The, you kind of have the, like, um, you know, the alien style space travel version of this. You go back into cryogenic freezing. You can pop out for a second, have a slice of bread, and then straight back in for another seven years until we wake you up again. Well, so Iona's breakfast, she always has like a slice of toast with some fruit in the morning. And so when you get that fresh bread, when you get that frozen bread out and you defrost it lightly it comes out like fresh bread because she's sort of like still getting getting used to her teeth and stuff so you don't want she can't eat dad's bread dad's you know burnt to shit crispy <laughs> crouton bread she's not going to eat so she needs airing on the side of bready what's bread what's wrong with your child's mouth it's just like completely shredded inside <laughs> oh yeah well I, bread is only able to be prepared one way in my household and i'm teaching her an important lesson from a young age um 
Uh, in other domestic news, Will, a little follow-up story. You might remember the tale of uh, me rescuing my neighbor's dog, liberating my neighbor's dog. Um, Stealing your neighbor's dog. Well, you know, it's a question of The story of about the night you kidnapped your neighbor's dog. And it does feel like listeners are split um, fairly down the middle. Even friends of ours who listen to the show were so incensed by my actions that I, I've received a number of private text messages saying, dude, you just stole someone's dog. So the point being, Will, uh, regardless of whether I stole the dog or, or liberated the dog, the relationship with neighbours is now very good. And um, to the point where they have went away this weekend and uh, they brought little Ralph around to stay with us. Well, that does mean that the owners of Ralph don't consider the fact that you stole the dog. I think that that could that because that would be rare if, say, like the owners of a bank went to the criminals who would rob the bank and said, "Hey, we're going to be away for the weekend. Could you take care of the money, please?" <laughs> or give them a tip. There you go. <laughs> well, it was interesting because it's part of me was like, okay, well, this obviously the relationship's good now, and whatever discomfort or awkwardness there was around me liberating their dog seems to have passed. Um, but it's weird how I haven't had a dog for two years now and there's just little things I forgot about dogs, about living with a dog. Like the fact that when there's the even the slightest hint of food, you know, someone is coming up to you all the time. I went for a walk this morning with, a, with him on a lead and I'm like, this is taking forever. Does he have to sniff every fucking tree? And then last night was probably the most... Well, I guess if you, if, if you were of the belief that I stole a dog, then this is probably what you would consider poetic justice. This seems like uh, a just reward. So um, I went, you went into a shop and someone stole the dog. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I took the dog out last night um, for a mid, you know, just a, a wee before bed. And he kind of was sniffing around the yard and he seemed to want to like do a bit more of a, of a sniff around. I was like, well, maybe he's got a poo or something. So... I'll just go out with him. And I sort of texted Gemma who was in bed to say, hey, I'm just going to take the dog you know, up, up the street. I'll be back soon. So I didn't even think for a second because Junior was not a lead dog. He was like very much stay by your heels. You could walk him off the lead anywhere. And I just assumed, <laughs> I don't know why, that this dog that I've met once that I stole, I mean that I liberated from my neighbors <laughs> would be the same. So as, uh, as listeners are aware, you know, where we live now is kind of semi-rural, so not a lot of street lights around, but enough that, you know, I thought I can keep an eye on this dog. So we start walking around and of course he's sniffing every bloody thing and we basically lap the block and then go down to the next cul-de-sac. And as we're coming up around the other side, he sees something and I don't know what he sees, but it's like a possum or a cat and he is boom, gone, like not even gone in 60 seconds, gone in 0. 0.0 seconds. I didn't even see him. He was just gone. And I had no idea where he was. And I'm like, Ralph, Ralph, <laughs> no noise. And then I'd hear like a bit of a, a, a scuffle in the bushes over there. And then it was like something from a horror film where, you know, I'd glance left because I'd hear something in those bushes. Then I'd glance right because I could hear something in those bushes. But I had no fucking idea where this dog was. Keep in mind, this is not my dog. So I don't know, do you whistle? Do you clap? Do you call his name? Like, what What? what do I need to get him back? And also, I have no lead. So even if I get him back, what the fuck do I do if he comes near me? So I'm, and I'm also in my pajamas, by the way, and it's freezing. And so I'm jogging down the street going like, and I, I'm also for some reason self-conscious about waking the neighbors. Like, I don't want to be running down the street yelling out for my boyfriend, Ralph. So I'm like, Ralph, Ralph. I'm doing that kind of like loud whisper yell. Ralph, Ralph, Ralph. You know what the great thing in that situation is? The, the dog's name is Ralph. <laughs> so it could technically sound like just a dog barking. Because you shouting Ralph just sounds like, <laughs> like a dog barking. A dog barking. <laughs> so I'm running up to, well, not running. I'm creeping up because I'm like, I'm just all in black in my pajamas. I look like a psychopath. Um, or everyone's got their lights off. So I'm assuming everyone in this street is in bed or, you know, getting ready for bed. And I don't want to go into their front yard and be, like you say, yelling Ralph like a dog. So I'm Ralph, 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 creeping Well, but particularly because somebody like you will come out, think that you've been left alone by your owners <laughs> oh, that was the weekend and take you back to their house. Oh, my God. Look, he's in his pajamas. We'll let him sleep downstairs. I would love that. If someone decided to take me in, made me a nice comfy bed, put some wheat bix in a bowl on the he ground. He doesn't have an owner. He's terrified. <laughs> Look at him running around in his pajamas, pretending he's a dog. <laughs> so uh, I glance Ralph, like crossing from one street to another, and so I start. The, the, the chase begins in earnest. 
And we go round that entire street, then back up the main street, then enter my cul-de-sac. And as we're, he's running, he won't stop. That's a thing too. It's like a game now because like the closer I get, the further he runs away. So I'm like, if I stand still and say, Ralph, he stops and looks at me. But then the second I take a step towards him, he's off. So it's like, what do I do here? He's not coming when I call him, but the second I move to him. So about halfway down the street, there's this um, house that a, a new family have just moved into, like literally three or four days ago. And Ralph decides just to take like a right turn up their driveway. And I could see that their lights were on and they've got this very sort of, there's like a shed down the front, but then there's this kind of like, you know, little garden area. And it's just, it's like a maze. Ralph runs in there and doesn't come back. And I'm like, shit. So I'm like, Ralph, 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 come on. Still not coming out. I'm like, I have to go in there and get this dog back. But I know this family are fucking like, in there and awake and if, if they look out their window they're just going to see maniac in his pajamas barefoot on a freezing cold night ralph ralph ralphing <laughs> in their yard i also enjoy the idea that the way you're going to introduce yourself to everybody in the neighborhood <laughs> is by breaking into their property <laughs> and yelling ralph but not even my dog by the way that's the other thing that was kind of like really oh. pissing me off is like not even my dog. Like, this is a dog I've been put in charge of. Yes, I should have taken him out with a lead, but I wasn't thinking. So, does he have a collar on yes. at this time? Does he have a collar on that has the phone number of, of the owner. his regular parents on it? Yes. Yeah, so, so, even if these neighbors find the dog, all they're going to do is call the owners of the dog who've left the dog with you and let them know that their dog is in their backyard, <laughs> no lead and no sign of you. Yeah. Well, so he's not coming out. And then I'm like, all right. I don't want to knock on the front door because I'm in my pajamas. And I also don't want to like just trespass because that's trespassing. But how am I going to get this fucking dog back? Because he's not coming when he's called. So I just like make the decision to trespass. <laughs> and I figure there's no lights on on the left side of the house. And I'm pretty much dressed in black. So if I just stick the left side of the house and creep up along the hedge, I'm pretty much going to be concealed unless someone suddenly turns a light on or there's like a security light or something. Yeah. Yeah. So I creep all the way up the side of the house. I get as close to the house and I'm like Ralph, Ralph, Ralphing till I can hear clinking. Someone's obviously like doing the dishes or something in the kitchen and I can't see into the backyard. And then I'm like, fuck it. This is not worth it. I'm just going to go back to the house. Like, or, or I'll keep looking or whatever. Like you say, maybe the owners will find him. So I creep back. It takes me about like another five minutes to get home. When I get home, fucking Ralph is sitting on the front step. Has it wasn't even in this neighbor's yard. Like he must have run up to their backyard and then cut through like a couple more houses to get to our front yard. Meanwhile, like a dick, I'm fucking like creeping up this per like, can you imagine if someone had come out and switched the light on? I said, What are you doing? And I said, Oh, sorry, my dog has just run up your backyard. I was just gonna get him back. Sure, okay, put the light up. No dog. Mm. What are you doing really? <laughs> that would be the next question, right? Right, because also it's not your dog. <laughs> There's actually no evidence that you own a dog because you don't own a dog. <laughs> so the, even the idea, yeah, I'm looking for my dog. Well, technically I'm looking for the neighbor's dog. Yes, I'm in my pajamas. Yes, I took him for a walk in the dark with absolutely Nothing. no lead or no knowledge <laughs> that he wouldn't run away. But the fact that Ralph has made it back to your house is quite impressive. I will say that. Well, that's, yeah. I mean, he well, he's familiar with the house now. And I think that it, it was just a good lesson because uh, we talk about getting a dog again. And I'm like, I don't think I'm ready. I don't think I'm ready yet. Like that, having a kid is enough responsibility right now. And I think that if I, because the other thing about him too is um, there is a Doberman who's just moved in on the other side of the fence. And this thing is like a prize fighter. Like this thing looks like a UFC dog. And Ralph, seemed, who's a tiny little terrier, I don't know what breed, but tiny, just wants to punch on with his dog. All the, every time this big Doberman walks past, he's at, at her, like he's up at the fence, he's yipping and yapping. This morning, I was cooking and I had to run out because Ralph was trying to scale the fence to like swat throw a punch. I'm like, Jesus Christ, like Junior was so low maintenance by comparison. I guess, like, I mean... Okay, so firstly, I love the idea that, you know, when you're out and about, Ralph was playing the game of acknowledging what his name was, but then the minute that you came towards him running away. So yeah. he was doing that version of somebody in a Chase car me. driving off as soon as the person tried to open the door yeah. and then just driving off a bit and then driving off a bit. So Ralph's having a ball. Ralph knows where you live. He's going to be back there. He's ducked into the backyard going, let's see if this idiot will go back into somebody else's backyard and trespass again. And then... 
Also, I love the idea that Ralph's just like, I don't need I don't need this dude, by the way. Look at that big dog. I could take that big dog. I'll fuck that big dog up. You've always got to worry about it's never the biggest guy at the pub that's yeah. the problem. The biggest guy at the pub doesn't want to get into a fight. The biggest guy in the pub is always having fights picked because somebody's like, I'm going to prove myself a hero by taking on the biggest guy in the pub. The one you've got to w- watch out for is that little fidgety guy in the corner who's got something to prove. And yeah. that feels like Ralph to me. Yeah, most likely carrying a blade. I mean, I should pat I should pat yeah. Ralph down before I yeah. let him into <laughs> his room. Yeah, you pat him down. He goes, you didn't have a lead, but I brought my own chain. <laughs> Uh, now, well, we've got a, a backlog of regular email to get through, so I thought we could just do a, a blast through the TOEFOP okay. mailbag. Um, you know, not badly up to date. These are all sent within the last month. <laughs> These are all emails from June. Um, this first one is from No Name. I said, how do they, how can you send an email with no name? It literally is just blank. There's nothing there. No first name, no last name. Who do you speculate who it might be? I mean, Big Brother, the government, um, uh, somebody who needs to get their identity protected, maybe like an Edward Snowden or like a a Julian Assange, somebody like that who's a big listener to the show but just obviously needs to, you know, or just somebody who's probably ashamed of listening to the show. That's probably most likely what it is. I've just scrolled to the bottom of his email. His name's Connor. Which Connor do you think it is? (laughs) Oh, it's John Connor. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it's from the future. John Connor. He's travelled back from the future. He's uh, keeping his, you know, identity away from the transform from the transformers, transformers. from the t- from the yeah. toasters. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you! I won't do what you tell me. Uh, he says I'm a lapsed TOEFOP listener from the pre-COVID times. For all I know, the show's gone off the rails, and you've started promoting QAnon Q&A, nonsense since. I caught Will on Triple J this morning, which is June 2021, with some discussion of his Wikipedia page image. As of writing, it does not look like it has been updated. Do you remember what the discussion was about? Yeah. So there's an image on my Wikipedia page from like 2012 or 2014 or like a fair while ago. And it's the image they use as sort of like, this is what I look like. And it feels like one of those things where I've been trying to adjust something on my computer during like a Zoom call and like I've got this quizzical look on my face and I'm really trying to work out what's going on and somebody's taken a screenshot of that moment and put it up as my as my photo. This is what I look like. Which, to be honest, if you look at how confused I am by things on a day-to-day basis, <laughs> it's probably a pretty accurate photo and representation of how I look. Well, connor has got some info on where that photo may have come from. Uh, there's a reason that the page image is the way it is. Wiki, 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 Wikipedia aims to be free, not just in cost, but as in freedom. You can find details on this on something like the GNU homepage if you want to go down that rabbit hole. But in short, it's a copyright thing. Wikipedia tries to not have copywritten things on it, both as text and as page images. Where all suitable images of something are under copyright, a low-quality image can be added or considered in fair use film posters as page images are a good example. Non-copyrighted images of modern things usually exist because photographers have decided to put them under a special license for open publishing. Right, that makes sense. Will's image is taken from an old video podcast, uh, which was placed under Creative Commons license by its copyright holder, probably the YouTube channel owner. It allows the image to be published anywhere without fear of legal action, usually with some conditions such as giving credit or not editing the image to something else. In Will's case, Wikipedia editors either could not or would not find a better quality free licensed image. <laughs> I like to think would not. Yeah. I, I like to feel like they have made a deliberate choice around this. Well, Podcast Mike's offering to take a screenshot of you now to up, and update your Wikipedia page. Do you want this Tom Morello image to be the, the lasting image? I think you look yeah, good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, grab I a think screenshot. This is better. It's certainly better than the shot that they have up there at the moment. <laughs> I would be more than happy with this. All right. Well, just uh, you can just pull, pose while I read the finish this email. So, Mike, uh, Mike, how sorry, Jesus, I haven't done that for a while. <laughs> I thought my computer screen had frozen for a second. I didn't realize you were actually pulling a face. <laughs> <laughs> Do you really want that image? Mike, when you publish this episode, can you publish that photo of Will? 
He's going to update the Wikipedia page now. Well, you know what? In the episode description, why don't you put a link to uh, Will's Wikipedia page so people can see the image that was taken. That is terrible. Uh, the solution is simple. Take a better photo or better yet, find a photo of you where you hold the copyright and publish it. Uh, probably in Twitter's TOEFL. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Thanks, Connor. That's, uh, that's useful information and we have updated Will's Wikipedia page. Uh, next bit of mail comes from Sasha. Which Sasha do you think it is? <laughs> Sasha Baron Cohen. Yeah, absolutely. He's in Australia at the moment. He's been listening to Tofop, looking for ideas for his uh, next character, and uh, he's decided to give us a little uh, email. Guys, I want to create a character who's like a pathetic middle-aged podcaster, and you guys are the perfect <laughs> <laughs> example of that. Can I spend his time with you? His first line is, guys, I was talking to my wife <laughs> about your podcast. <laughs> she hates it. You'd be like, okay. Uh, hey, guys. I'm loving the discussion about how Will would remain undetected by our soon-to-be AI overlords. Have you watched the show Travelers on Netflix? Have you? No, no I have not. I have not. Without going into it too much, the basic premise is that an all-powerful AI from the future is able to use any electronic device with a camera to find someone no matter where they are in the world. One key character remains undetected for 20 years until one small mistake reveals him to the AI and spells disaster for him. So, Will, before you take off to hide from the drone, watch this show for much-needed tips. Cheers on the great pod. I've been a listener for a long time and a Patreon supporter of Velocity. That's good stuff. Thank you, Sasha Baron Cohen. Well, I appreciate SBC. Thanks for coming on board. Thanks for, you know, uh, getting some of that Bruno money and sending it our way. Is that really a sci-fi premise, that anything with a camera can be used? to? I thought that was sort of like fairly common that if you have a smartphone or a laptop with a camera that anyone can access it or it has the ability to be accessed and tracked well i guess that the widespread accessing and trapping i think that we understand that we're being monitored online by you know our apps and some of those sort of things but i think that idea that just because i have a camera in my phone means that like you know somebody could be watching in now and listening in now feels hopefully a little bit science fiction still, yeah. but I guess that maybe it isn't science fiction. I mean, look, I think that we understand that people can watch in. I just think maybe that idea that someone in a central room could be like, oh, I want to know what Charlie Clawson is doing right now. I'm just going to like, you know, access his phone and like, you know, see what it gives me. Then that hopefully is still in the realms of science fiction. I don't know. Does it, what What is your gut instinct? Is that technology that we currently are capable of or is that science fiction? I think it's, I mean, it's it's got to be possible, right? The fact that you and I can, you know, do a live video stream of our footy tips on a Thursday means it's a little TV studio in our pockets. So the idea that someone much smarter than, than us, uh, you know, wouldn't know how to hack into that and set the camera and the microphone rolling without us knowing seemed very naive. It does actually, and, and and you know what? I'm just going to turn my phone upside down so the camera is pointed <laughs> at my desk. So take that, AI. Technology. Fuck you! I won't do what you tell me. Exactly. I, I continue to rage against the machine. Uh, this is from Angie. Angie, who? Take a guess. Uh, Angie Hart from Frente. Oh uh, yeah. Well, she said actually, I was accidentally down Kelly Street, and <laughs> uh, hey, two colon fop. Mel Burney in here, listening to the latest episode, uh, when did he send this? Uh, June 10th. So listening to an episode from two and a half weeks ago and hearing Will acknowledge that really the best thing you can do uh, anymore for people in lockdown is to shut the fuck up and get the vaccine was music to my bored shitty ears. Well, this, uh, I'm glad this two week old email is evergreen uh, as Sydney now enters a lockdown. And uh, yeah, around, around the country, there's a range of lockdowns. The borders are going up. I should mention at this point, because uh, listeners to this podcast, I'm sure this will affect some of them. I was meant to be at the Enmore this Saturday night in Sydney. That show is off and you hopefully have already heard that that show is off by now. Uh, Sunday, July the 4th, I've got two What You Talking About Will shows at the Powerhouse in Brisbane. They were already sold in a COVID safe setup. We were only doing limited crowds and at the moment as we record this on a monday those shows are still happening on sunday but obviously you know keep your eye to all the new announcements and if there's more of a brisbane breakout then maybe those circumstances will change but yes it is i, I have you are you booked in for a vaccine have you, you haven't got one yet right 
Uh, I no, I just am in the process now. I've just filled out the info they need about my age and stuff like that. But yeah, no, I want to get vaccinated soon, please. <laughs> I mean, well, me too. And you know, there's been a lot of talk. I mean, obviously, we live in a rural area, a regional area, but there's been a lot of talk around vaccines and whether the rollout is the fault of people not wanting to get the vaccine or whether it's there's not enough vaccines all i will say from my personal anecdotal experience in our area after spending several hours on the phone and holding and waiting trying to get an appointment and getting one in august uh that it has to do with the lack of vaccines and appointments not to do with uh people wanting to get them you know in america like you can go into any pharmacist and get like the vaccine they've made it Mm. so readily available it's like getting chewing gum well, they needed to, I mean, because most people had COVID. So they did have an imperative to get it out there as quickly as possible. But suddenly Australia's super slow vaccine rollout and the incompetent way that it has been handled is, you know, meaning that for a country that was ahead of a lot of the world, we are quickly falling behind. So congratulations. <laughs> We're everyone. doing a reverse Bradbury. Normally it's us winning when everyone else falls over. <laughs> now we were winning and we fall over. Rever- the reverse Bradbury. <laughs> Yeah, well, basically what happened was we did the Bradbury. Everybody else fell over. We skated by. But there was enough time left. There was another lap still to go. <laughs> and Stephen Bradbury style, we're like going along we're with our hands one. in the air celebrating. And everybody else is, in the meantime, got up off the ice, got back on their skates and skates past this as we fall over, basically. Uh, the sympathy and understanding is honestly appreciated because this fourth uh, lockdown in Melbourne has sucked so bad. I started listening to Tofop during the great lockdown of 2020, and you are now my favorite podcast. Yeah, we call that Stockholm Syndrome, mate. <laughs> but you know what, though? We started with somebody who stopped listening. Around the yeah around COVID, and we've gained one during COVID. So, basically, at the moment, we're even for COVID. COVID has had no effect on the audience of this podcast based on these letters. Uh, I've got a quick update on your Wikipedia page. Uh, yeah. Mike says the picture has been rejected by Wikipedia for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, I, I mean, you want another machine to rage against? I can rage against oh your computer. God. I mean, look. To be honest, I'm kind of glad that photo never made it out into the public sphere <laughs> for your sake, for but, everyone's but sake. But you haven't seen the photo that is already up there. Podcast Mike, can you copy the photo and drop that <laughs> into the window so Charlie can see what the new photo was competing against with the old photo? Okay, so you're telling me that this is an improvement on what is currently, what is currently I mean, on I, Wikipedia. I don't think it's going backwards. You can be the judge, though. You can tell me when when you see it, uh, you know, whether it's a better photo or a worse photo than the one that was already there. Uh, Angie says, she started listening during 2020. I'm a Wellosophy patron member. Hey, it's two in a row. But we'll change to be a TOEFOP uh, so I can get the bonus content because I now can't get enough. I'm working my way through the back catalogue and I've reached a point I now finally understand some of the in-jokes. And I know I still have loads more to get through. Honestly, I thought there was a colon fop people were writing to rather than Colin Fop. <laughs> that's, that, that's very common. Colin Fop, he's uh, Colin Firth's cousin. <laughs> Not as charming an actor. And the medical professionals' references had me guessing uh, for a while too. Thanks for the effort and keeping me laughing um, while they kept me living during a pretty dire 15 months. I hope you realize how much this pod helps, Angie. Oh, yeah, that's fucking terrible. <laughs> that looks like a screenshot taken from... Uh, you look like one of the organisers of the Fire Festival who's on the run, who's doing like an interview from a from some Russian hotel, <laughs> some country where they don't extradite. That's terrible. No, that looks like the screenshot some like Russian bot would send you to say that you've been caught masturbating to porn <laughs> and if you don't send 600 bucks to this Wells Fargo account, we're going to publish the photos to your email list. Yeah, I mean, you're right. This new one is is, is a marked improvement on that one. Uh, next bit of email is from... Email? Email? Mail. Our next bit of mail well, is from Kate. Kate who? Uh, something for Kate, the band Something for oh, yeah, Kate. Oh, from, yeah, from Something for Kate. Not to be uh, confused with something for cake. Uh, <laughs> now, she said she sent this to our Patreon, but was not sure if we got it. Chances are we did We did lose some of our Patreon messages in the mix. Uh, she says, hi, guys. I'm a longtime fan of Wills. And my mum first took me to see stand-up in Melbourne when I was 11 years old. 
Is that too young for one of your shows? Have any of your shows been appropriate for an 11 year old? Oh, I say once you're like basically 10 or 11 at the discretion of your parents. Okay. So you can't buy, can't come by yourself at 10 or 11. We say 15 plus is the general sort of standard. But if you're with your parents and your parents think it's acceptable, then I'm fine with that. My husband introduced me to Tofop by playing me the episode where Pam airs screwed over Charlie's dreams of being on Round the Twist. And I've been a fan ever since because nothing turns me on more than a small boy's <laughs> dreams crushed in the most humiliating fashion possible. <laughs> We were listening to episode 333 today when someone told you they listened to Tofop with their partner and Will said he always thought Tofop was something that you'd hide from your partner. <laughs> well, our family goes one better. We save Tofop for our weekend trips. That includes our two-year-old and our nine-month-year-old. Well, I think a lot of things are making sense here. She got to see you at 11 and now she's exposing her two-year-old to two guys, one cup. Uh, we have a rule that we don't swear in front of our kids, but somehow swearing on Tofop doesn't fall under this rule. Usually listening to you with our kids isn't an excuse, but in one episode, Charlie broke out his French accent, which made our baby cry. <laughs> <laughs> Sacre bleu! I made the infant upset! I hate myself! <laughs> Thanks, Charlie. Good one. We haven't brought our kids any Tofop merch yet, but we do have a seal and hazmat suit shirt, and my husband and I both have Thor and 20 pie shirts um, after a red bubble mix up. Although, never intentionally, we have both been wearing our Tofop t shirts when out together. That's amazing. That's a unicorn, right? If someone sees a couple in two different, or what's better, Will? Matching Tofop t shirts or like two different Tofop t shirts? Two different Tofop t shirts. Yeah, that's a unicorn. If someone sees that and grabs a snap, we'll give you something, a prize of some kind. If you're wondering what kind of people we are that we listen to Tofop on Family Car Chips, my husband showed me the Hey Dad Doodleberg, the Hey Dad Doodleberger videos on YouTube when we were first going out as a way to test my sense of humor. Do you know what they are? Hey no. Podcast Mike, you're young and you're hip. What are the Hey Dad Doodleberger videos on YouTube? Is it something we want to play or is it is it going to get us in trouble? I mean, oh, he's got no I know idea. that Hey Dad was that TV show where the like the dad in it was doing some pretty dodgy stuff. Was he offering people doodle burgers? I don't know. That's a Is thing. That... You put Hey Dad and Doodle in the same sentence. I'm just not really sure. <laughs> yeah, burgers not making it better. Uh, this was way before I, I it turned out to. Uh, this was way before it turned out that the doodle burgers were somewhat accurate. Okay, so someone's. I'm going to suggest someone's revoiced old okay. episodes of Hey Dad and and made uh, the dad seem dodgy. Anyway, massive fans of yours both. Please keep making this comedy conversation between two old mates because it's a brilliant idea for a show. We'll have to decide another time to listen together or if our two-year-old starts repeating some of the shit you guys come out with. But until then, you've got a great soundtrack for our days out. Well, that's awesome. We accompany this family on family trips. I can't even I think like of that. Well, because I like that it started with the family connection, you know. Dad's taken, you know, daughter along at, what, 11 years old. Well, yeah. we don't know. Yeah, daughter, uh, where is she? Mum. Right? Is this mum, Sam? Mum took you. Yeah. Took took her to see oh, you. Mum. When she mum was took her to see me. Eleven years old, and she's passing on the tradition. As somebody who would like to not have to get another job in my lifetime, I would endorse all my fans <laughs> to not only breed but to pass it on. <laughs> yeah. Get them a red bubble account. If you could just hook them into the tofop infrastructure, that would be handy. Um, did you ever listen to comedy albums with your family? I feel like we listened to a few Monty Python albums. We had like a goodies album, but I don't know if mum and dad were involved, but I think my brothers and sisters definitely we would have listened to some comedy albums together. Not No, the trip. first time I remember listening to a comedy album, we've talked about this before, but uh, was at my friend Peter Shepherd's house when we listened to the soundtrack of Life of Brian. And then I got into... Um, comedy albums and started sort of collecting them myself but I can't remember ever sitting around with like maybe on a road trip I might have like played one with mum in the car definitely wouldn't have tried it with dad hey mum have you heard of Eddie Murphy's Raw <laughs> <laughs> mum you heard of this guy Kevin Bloody Wilson <laughs> Let's not take the ute. I'll tell you later. Uh, this is from Mary, Will. Mary who? Um, uh, the one who had a little lamb. No, no, Mary. Double, double R-Y. M-E-double-R-Y. Oh, uh, Merry Christmas. Yeah, it's from Merry Christmas. It's from the, the, the holiday, Merry Christmas. Uh, dear Charlie and Will, 
Today, I visited the updated website for the first time so I could listen to episode 342 because for some reason, the iTunes podcast app hasn't been updated. Nice work on the website. It's very slick and Foz's artwork has quite the Power of Grayskull or perhaps Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom vibe. Power of Grayskull? I don't know. I don't quite get that, but sure. Anyway. Well, what I would say on this is I highly recommend, if even if you just download the podcast to some sort of other app, go and check out the website at tofob.com. It really is much more impressive than anything else we've ever produced. And it's, and there's more than just podcasts there. There's like comic books and there's heaps of great stuff. So it's a it's an interactive experience. It's like a moving art gallery for James's, James Fosdyke's work, isn't it? It is. And as we all know, James Fosdyke's work, clearly the best thing about this entire <laughs> podcast. As I started listening, I remembered last week, I was telling some colleagues about how I got tickets for Will's Brisbane show, which is still happening. And this, uh, and this will be close to the 20th year of being to your annual gig, I think. Well, there you go, Will. You talk about generational fans. 20 well, years. Well, technically, last year show didn't happen. So I had a show in Brisbane last year that got cancelled. So if this one gets cancelled, that's two years in a row. Oh but God. thank you. I appreciate the support. Now just get breeding and start getting your kids buying tickets. That's the yeah, message, exactly. right? <laughs> yeah. The, the best thing you can do is keep buying tickets yourself. The second best thing you can do is start breeding and <laughs> make <laughs> your children also come to my shows. My colleagues were so bizarrely excited and said, I should tell you and that you might be pleased or creeped out. That I've seen nearly every show. Who knows? Well, are you cre- are you creeped or pleased? Pleased. No, it's a great compliment, and I appreciate anyone who's stuck with me because some of those shows weren't amazing. What would make it a creepy? Like, what, is there a minor twist to that statement? I've seen every show of yours the last twenty years, mm. and, and, and I can and I can recite them all from heart. Okay, is that creepy? <laughs> I mean, that's sad. <laughs> that's probably more sad than creepy. <laughs> I can list all the names of them in order. If no. somebody said to me, I could list all the names of them in order, because I'm just thinking if they can do something that I couldn't do. Right. There is no way for a million dollars if you said to me, list all your shows and their names in order that I would be able to do it. If one of my fans could do that, I, I'd find that a little. No, I wouldn't find it creepy. No, it's not creepy. I think it's more, I've been to every one of your shows for the last 20 years. Mm. They speak to my soul. <laughs> that would be creepy. Like, yeah. Oh, I've been to every one of your shows the last 20 years and I love you on Spicks and Spurs. <laughs> Still haven't worked it out. I started listening to you, Will. Sorry, Charlie. This is Will Centric. When I was at uni in the 90s and you were on Triple J Breakfast and I think the first show was at the Vizzy Theatre at the Powerhouse in Brisbane. Is that right? Yeah, possibly, which is actually where my shows are this weekend. Since then, I've pretty much uh, been to all of them and they're all over the place too. I lived in Sydney for a while, so I saw a few at the Comedy Store at, Fo- uh, Comedy Store at Fox Studios and the Opera House and also at the Melbourne Comedy Festival a few times. I've taken partners, friends, and even my sister once. We were in Melbourne uh, to visit the grave of her partner who had very sadly taken his own life the year before. So I got a last minute ticket to your show so we could get out and have a good laugh, which we did. I mean, that ends nicely. <laughs> thank, thank fuck. How was your show, Will? It was good, except that one person was sobbing uncontrollably like the whole show. And you know what the thing is? I'd, I'd assume that was about me because yeah. the, the egocentric performer, you just, but then why is that person crying? And then I'd like go after them. I'd berate them. I'd like, this is a comedy show. You're bringing it down. Not realizing that somebody has perhaps bought tickets to your comedy show in the hope that you're the only thing that can put a smile on a sad situation. You're like, who the fuck is this? <laughs> My favorite joke has always been your riff on Tony Abbott and Stop the Floats and Chicken Salt comes a close second. So Tofop is also my favorite part of the week as a, patro- as a patron. And it's also been lovely getting to know Charlie as well. Your bin and neighbor and noise anxiety are things I totally empathize with. And I cried when you lost Junior as I too had recently put my boy down. After such a shit 2020, I'm looking forward to Will's July gig. And many Me more, <laughs> and many more years of default <laughs> with you both. Uh, P.S. I worked for a while in an airline, not in customer service, and most of the time, anything is possible if you're nice and keep your mouth shut. Skulls and ashes are okay. If you're a big deal, miracles may even occur. If it's peak hour and the weather engineering stuffs up, or you behave like an entitled jerk or lose your shit, then they will give no fucks. Yeah, well, that makes sense. I kind of. That's that kind of tracks with my experience. I, I sort of figured that what was being done, you know, was possible, but she was just putting a little bit of mayo on it, making me feel like she was she was doing a, a, a bigger favor for me than she actually was. 
this is from Lauren. Lauren who, Will? Uh, Lauren uh, um, Lauren Jackson, the former Australian basketballer and international uh, in, uh, women's basketballer and women's NBA basketballer. Hmm, interesting, because she wants to talk about work for actors and comedians. I was recently introduced to a series of humorous short ads featuring Russ, the electric influencer, as a bumbling electrician who takes the piss out of the trade while also featuring a product by the manufacturer Alco. Comedian Russell Fletcher is perfect in the role and he secured work even during lockdown. What companies can benefit from a comedian making fun of the industry in short, funny skits and who would you cast? Well, fuck. I mean, we all need work right now. So right. <laughs> give us something What could Tofop do? I think this is the bigger yeah. question. Like, let's not you know, find work for other comedians right now. Yeah, Russell Fletcher, by the way, us. absolutely super talented person. Yeah. So... Um, can understand that he would do a good job. But what could TOEFOP do? So it's got to be something that we can take the piss off as well as endorse. Mm. What do we... What I mean, it's either from an advertising point of view, it's, you either want it to be something that's like a natural fit, where you're like, oh, of course those guys are... Or you want it to be the complete opposite. So it's a real surprise. And it's like, ah, oh, Anthony Mundine's, you know, a spooking uni university or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Anthony Mundine's uh, for ham. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Um, okay. I don't eat ham because it's against my religious beliefs. But if I was going to eat ham, I'd eat Don. You know what we could do? We've talked about it. What if the government said, shit, this vaccine rollout has been a disaster. It's been mixed messages. People aren't sure where to get the vaccine. People are being picky with the kind of vaccine. We need two humorous guys who have the ability to kind of get serious when the need calls for it to uh, do a campaign, a series of, let's say, six two-minute humorous videos where we uh, inform and encourage people to get the vaccine. Do you reckon we could do that? Yeah, absolutely, we could do that. Uh, I don't know if we'd need six videos, though. Wouldn't it just be like, okay, so all right, let's role play. Okay. Um, I'm the person who's trying to convince you in this to get the vaccine. So you're the sort of the, the, person just... who's come with questions and I'm I'm the humorous person in this ad. Okay, all right, okay. Um uh, who starts? <laughs> I don't want to get the vaccine. So, uh, but I don't want to get the vaccine. Why would I start? <laughs> I mean, you've got to you've got to engage me, right? Well, no, you're you're like, hey, Will, I don't want to get the vaccine. Okay. Here's my like okay, problem right. with getting the vaccine, and then I'll explain in a humorous way, yeah, like why you should get the vaccine. Okay, hey, Will, I know everyone's talking about getting the vaccine, but I've got some mm. questions. Why should I get the vaccine? Well, firstly, uh, herd immunity is very important for keeping the nation safe. As as a responsible member of society, which I know you are, Charlie. Uh, then you have a responsibility to, you know, be part of that. If everybody goes out and gets the vaccine, there's going to be full crowds back at uh, football matches within three years, which is about the right time for you when your team might play in the finals again. Yeah, I don't know. I heard those vaccines have some terrible side effects. I don't want to be picking up 5G signals in my brain. Well, you, of course you do. Can you imagine watching high-speed YouTube videos in your brain? Nothing would make you happier than when you're out walking a stranger's dog or taking your daughter for a walk to be able to be scrolling through YouTube in the chip that's in your brain. Well, how do we know that they're really safe? We don't, but how do you know that anything's really safe? <laughs> I mean, you're eating shit and doing shit all the time. I hung out with you in your 20s. You took heaps of shit that wasn't Wait safe. You didn't, didn't know where it I came like from, where this video who's was. it was. <laughs> Talk about deflection. Ted, answer the bloody question. Don't go into character assassination. And scene. <laughs> scene. <laughs> there you go. Who's not getting a vaccine after that rigid sales bitch? <laughs> um, Okie dokie. This is from Nathan. Nathan who? Uh, Nathan, uh, Nathan, uh, oh, Nathan. Yeah, um, there, who are from famous Nathans? Nathan uh, Fillion, uh, star of whatever show he's a star of? Yeah. Um, Firefly? I can't really think of like, like Nathan. good famous Nathans. There must be. like Nathan. Who's, who's a, a famous Nathan? Nathan Lane. Nathan Lane? Uh, says yeah. Podcast Mike. Nathan. Nathan Buckley. Former oh, yeah. Collingwood Bucks. coach Nathan Buckley. Okay, he's got a, he's got his top five list here of freestyle yeah. rappers. Uh, long time listener, first time to Fopper Sponder. Just finished listening to Willosophy, where Will mentioned his aspirations to be a freestyle rapper um, if he could not fail. Firstly, mm -hmm. you need to check out Harry Mack on YouTube if you haven't already. He'll blow your mind. Is that the guy who raps like about like pancakes and stuff? Have you seen that dude? He's a real fast rapper, and he's just like freestyle about just doing no, but I'll everyday have to things. Check him out. 
Secondly, I can't believe Will has given Charlie such a hard time over the years for awesome, not rhyming with Clawson. Sure, it isn't perfect, but it uses assonance uh, to form a multi. Take your rap skills to the next level. You could add more syllables to the multi. Charlie would have to agree that Charlie Clawson is hardly awesome with his gnarly foreskin. Yeah, closer. I'm not I'm not anti that, I've got to be honest with you. Because then it becomes more of a stylistic choice. Well, all I'm going to say is I, I think that we're talking about two different things, which is could Clawson be using rap? I mean, Eminem makes things like sound like they rhyme all the time that don't rhyme. I was saying it didn't rhyme. I wasn't saying that you couldn't make it sound like another rhyme in a rap. But you're just saying that – but you're saying you're willing to concede – that stylistically it has a place within the rap milieu. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm fine with that. Oh, like, this is the biggest concession you've don't... made in 10 years. <laughs> no, I'm fine with the fact that rappers use words that don't rhyme, that they make sound like they rhyme all the time. I'm fine with that. I, like, but it does not mean that, that, that Clawson rhymes with Orson. <laughs> <laughs> I can't fucking believe. It's 10 years of this same... Conversation. <laughs> uh, this is from Cara. Cara who, Will? Um, Cara Delevingne. I knew the, you were going to uh, say that. I could think of what's it. Is there another famous Cara? Cara. Cara. Um, no, nah, she's the only one. Uh, Pete Evans and St Kilda Footy Club is the subject. Hi, Will and Charlie. This is a belated message regarding Not Manu. I'm pretty slow on the emails. I'm sorry. Uh, Not Manu was an episode of Fofop you did with uh, Hamo, was it about three or four? Yes, four about not referring to uh, Pete Evans as Pete Evans, but calling him Not, not Manu. Manu. I moved to rural Tassie about 10 years ago, and I've lived a pretty simple and frugal life ever since. I quite like pop culture, but I've missed out on many key references from the past decade because we haven't had a TV or good internet connection. I also don't have any colleagues. I'm a self-employed ceramicist. Oh, excuse me, I just burped right to the microphone when I said ceramicist. I'm so sorry. That's Cara. That's terrible by me. That was not. That was had nothing to do with finding out you're a ceramicist. It didn't turn my stomach. It was just a just a burp. Anyway, uh, my fellow Hemet friends and I like to discuss things like cabbage yields instead of pop culture. Anyway, a couple of years ago, I signed up for an unlimited data plan on my phone and discovered the joy of podcast. I love Tofop and I've probably made over a thousand pairs of earrings while listening to your various shows. We keep her laughing so she keeps keeps on ceramic. <laughs> what do you Well, we're both creating things to put in your ears. Ah, there you go. For her, it's earrings. For us, it's entertainment. When the pandemic first broke, there was a lot of chat about Pete Evans, and I felt like I had my finger on the pulse of what was going on. Then I listened to an episode of Fofop where Will was explaining the Pete Evans horse video to Dave Anthony, and I decided to check it out. I don't know what that refers to. It sounds terrible. What's the (laughs) Pete Evans horse video? So basically, Pete Evans is doing one of his, like, trying to correct what's going on in the mainstream media rants. Right. But for whatever reason, he's decided to do it while, like, like head-to-head with a horse, like it's a co-press conference <laughs> with him and the horse. <laughs> Who's making the better points? I mean, the horse. <laughs> the horse. The horse understands when to stay silent. <laughs> Um, I'd never seen that man before, and I realized that for a good 12 months, I'd have been imagining Pete Evans to be Peter Everett, the previous host of Ready, Steady, Cook. <laughs> I was actually <laughs> quite impressed that he was able to leverage his Ready, Steady, Cook fame and gain a cult-like following in wellness. <laughs> it was a pretty impressive comeback, if nothing else. I also always thought he was non- a non-threatening, likable guy, and it made me a little sad that the world was shitting on him. So anyway, it's not Pete Everett, but do you think he has it no, in him? No, but Pete Evans is a little ready, steady, cooked, I yeah. <laughs> particularly in this horse video. But do you think uh, Pete Everett has it in him to pivot from daytime and gain a fault like a cult like following one day? I'm not familiar with the, the work of Peter Everett or Pete Everett. Are you? I'm familiar with yeah, Peter I am, Spider Everett. Yeah, I used to watch... I mean, I would prefer if we're really going to go for TV cooks who are going to start a cult, I would go back to uh, Peter Russell Clark. Oh, yeah. Can't get it. 
Come and get it. Come and get it. With, with Peter, Peter Russell, Russell Clark. Clark. From the, the city the, what is to it? the to outback. The outback. He's Australia's brightest spark. Come and get oh, it. really? Come and get it. There's food you'll love to eat. Come and get it. Come and get it. There's people you can meet. Key change. Cook a shark or make a hamper. Feed an eagle. Pack a damper. On a farm or out at sea. Learn a recipe or three. Come and get it with Peter. Russell. No, you did what's it? There's a full response. Oh. Come and get it with Peter. G'day. Russell. G'day. Clark. <laughs> Thank See you. See you later. <laughs> that will be our Hang live on. show. No, one one by one. We've we've got to explore these okay. lyrics a little bit further. So run me through it um sentence by sentence. I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm not few in there. certain. That's my childhood memory coming back to me there. So okay, uh, come and get it, come and get it with Peter Russell Clark. From the yep. city to the outback, he's Australia's brightest spark. So this is where I have an initial question because were we referring to Peter Russell Clark as Australia's brightest spark at that time? That seems to be something you'd reserve for Australia's chief scientist, or if Dr. Oh, Carl, an electrician, had like a night at least. <laughs> oh yeah, he's Australia's brightest spark. Yeah. But like, did we ever watch Peter Russell Clark asking where's the cheese and think, you know what, this is Australia's brightest spark? I think it's just, uh, you know, to refer back to our rap conversation, it's just a perfect rhyme. If your name's Clark, then Spark just fits in there real nicely, doesn't it? I mean, Bark, Dark, Fark. <laughs> yeah, it's Australia's <laughs> biggest Fark. <laughs> okay, what else? so keep going. Um, what were the next lines? Get it, get it. With, I, I mean, forgive me, but I'm probably going to have to sing it in order to remember. Yep. Uh, Peter Russell Clark, from the city to the outback, is Australia's brightest Spark. Come and get it. Come and get it with food you'll love to eat. Come and okay, get it. Yeah, good. Come and get it. There's people you can meet or should meet. I'm not really sure. Okay, but either way, okay. good. Okay. Then the key well, this change. This is all on brand. Um, oh, what was it? Cook it, catch a shark or – no, was it? Something shark or build a hamper, feed and eat. Oh, no. Hang on. No, wait. Come and get it. Because Peter Russell. Show you spider spider. Cook a shark or make a hamper. Feed, no, or, or make some damper, feed an e. Oh, fuck, I don't know. <laughs> right, I'm going to look it up. Peter Russell Clark, lyrics. <laughs> Cook a, catch a shark and make a hamper, feed an eagle, make some damper? I don't know. On a farm or out at sea, learn a recipe or three. <laughs> I think that's right. Come and get it with Peter. G'day, Russell. G'day, Clark. Oh, here we go. I've got the I've got the music. Are you okay. ready for this? Come and get it, come and get it with Peter Russell Clark in the city or the outback. He's Australia's brightest spark. Okay, we agree it's Australia's brightest spark. Come and get it, come and get it. Good food you love to eat. Come and get it, come and get it. And there's people you can meet. In a very eighties moment, in that moment, he's chatting to Rob De Costello. <laughs> <laughs> Cook a shark or make a damper. Cook a shark or make a make a damper. To not catch I mean, a shark. cook some flake or make a damper. I mean, we're not going to cook a whole shark. Did you ever see an episode of Peter Russell Clark where he like had a whole shark? Well, in that moment of the intro song, it's a cartoon of him in a boiling pot with a shark, a smiling shark. Uh, oh, I thought it was catch a shark, make a damper, but. Cook a shark makes more sense. Like that's a bit more Steve Irwin territory to be catching the shark, right? Yeah, somebody else has got to catch the shark. Then you bring it into Peter Russell Clark, and he cooks it. Feed your ego, pack a hamper. Feed your ego, pack a hamper. Not feed an eagle. <laughs> I was going to say because the eagle was absolutely throwing me. Feed your ego, though. What does well cooking? Oh, as in you feel good about yourself because you've cooked something. I mean, again, like it's not. Doesn't make much more sense than eagle, but like feed an eagle is a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> Leave it, unless it's like a West Coast eagle. Unless like Ben Cousins is just rocking around your house and he looks like he's in need of a meal, then sure, feed an eagle. But otherwise, feed your ego is an interesting line, isn't it? Yeah, it is interesting. And it's also, I mean, it makes sense to me that it would be feed an eagle. If I'm imagining that he was catching sharks and feeding an eagle sort of like flows on <laughs> naturally, right? Okay. Come and get it with Peter 
today. It must be said that he, uh, I don't remember Peter Russell Clark being quite so porn starry. I mean, he's wearing silk shirts unbuttoned down to the belly button, hairy, hairy chest with a gold medallion nestled right in those chest pubes. It's, do you remember him being porny? Can, it, it, uh, there was a famous swearing video. Yes. Can you Google Peter Russell Clark swearing and see if that comes up? Because there was a famous video of sort of outtakes, I guess, of the show <laughs> that went around a long time ago that uh, it's a, revealed that maybe Peter Russell Clark was a little porn starry. Uh, Peter Russell Clark bloopers, it seems to be here. Mm. Yes. Great. Fan. Oh, there's quite a few. Okay, here we go. Hopefully this is, which one's this going to be the swearing one? Okay, here we go. Maybe it's this one. Footage sourced from the Australian television archive. No, surely his bloopers haven't been archived. G'day. Fucking shit here. G'day. <laughs> What's the fucking name of this cunt? Oh, g'day. Butterfingers here. Did it too early. G'day. Bernard King here. Want to show you me dick. Oh, g'day. I've been invited to the launch of the fucking dinner and I couldn't put the phone down. Good rolling. Uh, right. Anyway. And action. G'day. I've been invited to the lodge for dinner. I'm not even a member. So I'm making something special with some broccoli and some bucking that stuff. That's carrot. <laughs> G'day. I've been invited to something special. Get fucked. Now, where's the cheese? Australian Eden, by the way, you cunt. G'day. <laughs> so hard boil and shell them. Roll them in flour. Press sausage fucking meat, so, so hard boil and shell them, roll them in flour, press sausage meat and vegetables around them, brush them with a beaten egg, cover them with breadcrumbs and fucking fry the cunts till they go black, you <laughs> prick. Right, Martha? So there you go, that's family planning. Oh, but be careful, cooks make you fucking fart. Ready? Another one, sorry. Right, Martha? So that's family planning, but be fucking careful. <laughs> Jesus Christ! <laughs> I do not Australian <laughs> Eden, by the way, you cunt. <laughs> Joe Pesci and Goodfellas. That is, that is out of control. Oh my god! I don't even know how we got onto that, but I'm so glad we did. Um, uh, okay, <laughs> well, I don't even know where we are. In fact, I think we might just have to leave it there because I'm a bit yeah. thrown by all of that. Um, oh man! Uh, if you want to check out more great podcasts. <laughs> If you want to check out more great podcasts, you should go to tofop.com. Uh, there's lots of other podcasts. There's Philosophy, Two Guys, One Cup, Fofop. Who's on Philosophy this week? <laughs> Will, you count? Um, an incredible uh, guy, actually. His name's Owen Eastwood. And Owen Eastwood has been a, uh, a sports motivator, a sports psychologist who works with um, high-level teams around the world. He's currently working with the British Olympians. Uh, but he's worked with the South African cricket team, like the All Blacks, uh, the women's cricket, like all, incredible resume of people he's worked with in the high performance sphere, particularly uh, when it comes to teamwork is his specialist area. And he um, is part Maori and he uh, wrote this incredible book called Belonging, which was about, you know, just the connection between people and what role we play in society. And anyway, I spoke to him from London Absolutely fascinating chat if you like sports, but even if you don't like sports, there's just a lot of really cool lessons and stories in that episode. And uh, you're doing faux fop this week. Who's going to be on faux fop? Uh, Ty Hara, you might know him best as an actor from Home and Away, but he's also a writer and director who made a brilliant uh, web series uh, called Colorblind, which is sort of based on his experiences being an actor of colour in Australia. It's about uh, Australia's number one ethnic casting specialist, who, of course, is a middle-aged white Australian. So we talk a lot about that series and just his experiences growing up in Australia and, and what it's like sort of making a living as an actor of colour in Australia. So check that out, as well as Two Guys, One Cup, which is back again um, and will be a bit more of a, a different tone this week because the Saints had a rare win on the weekend. So less suicidal, less wellness checks needed uh, for me this week. And the Bulldogs looking as good as ever. Uh, Marcus Bontempelli kicked maybe goal of the year yesterday he just was amazing yesterday like, i mean he is having that season anyway whatever that you'll we'll hear save more that of that for our footy, <laughs> we'll save that for our footy podcast where for once we might both be happy to talk about football <laughs> <laughs> and if you want to support us the best way to do that is to go to patreon.com slash tough up lots of bonus content up there we evaluate the shrek soundtrack we're just about to do another bonus episode where we go through the patreon mailbag so that's all at patreon.com slash tofop i'm charlie clawson I'm Will Anderson. 
That's Australian. Eat them, you cunt. 